אוקיי. interpretation would be BV interpretation. In string theory, we call it target space. second interpretation would be modular space or configuration space interpretation. So it is actually good if something has two interpretations because we could develop each of the interpretation. And here we, and this formula is a bridge when we can go from one, one interpretation to another interpretation. And actually it is a bridge between field theory in the very general sense and string theory also in the general sense. Mm -hmm. So I would, you see, I was thinking which interpretation to call main. And finally I decided that there are kind of equal. Sometimes one interpretation is dominant in generalization, sometimes another. So my goal would, do, would be to present to you these two interpretations and we will discuss how it goes in the first way and in the, in the second way. But first, <laughs> but first let us discuss what I call perturbative formula. So first I say in words. So actually perturbative formula relates to infinity structures. Or you may call algebras, but uh, I prefer the word structures. When you contract a cyclic subcomplex. So <clears throat> before we apply this and study how it comes out, I'd like to recall the notion of infinity structures. 
So my plan would be, once again, recall infinity structures and their symmetries. Second would be BV view. And C would be modular space view. Okay. So I'll start with a brief introduction to infinity structures, and I'm sorry for people who already do it. So everything starts when you have a space V, V will be a complex. With differential Q. And then suppose there is a binary operation here. So I'm using the traditional way how people got it, got it. Then I'll generalize. So if you have a binary operation, you may ask some property of this operation. You may ask if M2 is associated So you are writing the associative diagram. You see, I will not hurry up here because uh, it's interesting to look at these diagrams from different point of, points of view. So first of all, <clears throat> why I am writing it as a planar graph? Because in this way I mimic that I could not freely interchange one and two. And if you ask what would happen if I could freely interchange one and two, it will be another story, however, it is related. Second, so this is zero. So I can observe another thing. I can observe that if I consider the boundary in this picture. This looks pretty much like a disk. And this also looks pretty much like a disk. 
And this is not a coincidence of notation. Actually, <coughs> this diagram is related to the disk. Actually, these two diagrams are uh, the generations of a disk. This could degenerate, degenerate in this way. So it means that point two is closer much closer to point one than point three. And it would also degenerate in that way. And this difference means that somehow these two things are equal or equivalent. And uh, this is associativity equation. The associativity equation is very important because uh, this is the main equation for geometry. So in the French school, People answer to the world what the to the world what the space is by saying that space is commutative associative algebra. Commutative is kind of simple. You just do this illegal operation to interchange the inputs. However, associativity is this very important quadratic structure. So it is equation on multiplication. Moreover, if you look not at the rings, but you look at category theory, you see that the only axiom in category theory is that composition of morphisms is associated. And this is also not a coincidence. If you look at these lines, you may even label them like alpha, beta, alpha goes here, here goes gamma. And you may look at this alpha, beta, beta, gamma, gamma something as a morphism. And this is exactly the axiom of the category. Also, in the very old days of string theory, namely in the year in the year 1970, people looked at these pictures and they said, you know what it is? They said it is about mesons. So meson was a pair of quarks. And there should be QCD string between them. And these diagrams were seen in the physical literature of uh, 60s as uh, a meson scattering diagram. Exactly the same picture. You see, when you have exactly the same picture, it means that you have exactly the same mathematics. It's true. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't get this point with uh, alpha, beta, gamma. What was that? Ah. You see, you have here like boundaries. If you can see it as a disk, mm -hmm. you can write down, so here is out. You have this component of the boundary. Let us label it by alpha. In the category interpretation, this would be the object alpha. And this line 
this line is labeled by some beta and it would be an object beta. Mm -hmm. And this line is labeled by, labeled by the object gamma. While this line is labeled by the object delta. So equivalently, you can label these things on the disk. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So here you have a disk where the boundary is cut into four pieces. And each of these four pieces has a label. Here you see the generation of a disk. But and in, also in, label in the generation, the where are the morphisms? Uh, ah, okay. So in any case, here you see objects, right? Mm -hmm. So before you start to see morphisms, you should see objects. However, gross and big things that everything is reverse. Or in other words, okay, what, what are the ribbons? So the pairs alpha, beta, beta, gamma. So this thing that connects alpha and beta is a morphism. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is also a morphism. So, okay, so. so these objects are quarks. Meson is something that joins the quarks together. When two mesons hit each other, they produce another meson. And you should consider this as a composition of the morphisms. Mm -hmm. And again, so you see, you, you could meditate with this diagram a lot. However, due to great John Bias, so John Bias says, you never have zero. You only have equivalent. So this zero should be represented that it is exact. So here we put Q applied to the new thing. out one, two, three. And you call it M3. And this thing, so what I wrote, I wrote homotopical associativity. So if I keep labels, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. I will have here an equation of homotopical associativity. So you may ask how to apply Q to diagram and why I'm writing this commutator. So in the language of pictures, commutator, you can take commutator between two pictures or between two operations. Q is also an operation. So you may write down the right hand side in the following way. You have You apply here plus Q applied here and, and there are two other pictures. What is important is that there is also a picture where Q is applied 
to the output two. Not only you are act not only to in inputs but also to outputs. So here we have this relation. And this is called homotopical associativity. Now, I am lazy to write, now I am lazy to write down this, writing down these equations. So I would say, just imagine that you have not only binary operation, but also you, One to one operation. I don't, don't know how to call it. V to V. How can you modify this equation? So, of course, it's very easy. You just put it here. So actually you combine operations in all possible way that you want. Now, these are equations for operations M2, M1. What about the rest? Namely, are there any operations on M1 that we are going to write down. What are there any operations on M3 that we are going to write down? Yes, of course. We would like to see the full bunch of operations. Namely, of course, there will, there will be Q. And there will be actually a lot of relations here. So you first, want to, you want to have both Q and M1? Exactly, exactly. Like David Gross said. In the year 1973, David Gross wrote a paper saying that uh, he made the construction that contradicts to theorem of several people, including Einstein. And the editor asked him if he actually wants to, to keep it. Otherwise, the, pep, the, the paper would be published immediately. And he said, yes, I insist on putting this in the paper. And his great paper on uh, Taubnat instantons as a monopole was pu published with, in 73, with what saying, yes, it it uh, contradicts to Einstein theory, and Gross was right. So at that time he was young. So I say that Q and M1 are two different things. Mm -hmm. In order to explain how and why Q and M1 are two different things, I would like to write the same equation where we have no M2, okay? Mm -hmm. You see, maybe now you will see why I prefer the name uh, structures and not algebras. Because when you say algebra, you somehow insist that the main thing is M2. When you say structure, you, you insist that the main thing is an operation. And since one is less than two, main operation is M1, and as Pasha, you know very well, there will be more operation that you studied in your papers, okay? I know. Right? <laughs> so, now, 
Now let us see what kind of equations could we write here. So there is the first equation that q squared equals to zero. And there is a second equation. It is the equation that m1 is a differential. Of course, up to homotopy. So plus or minus, there is a sign rule. Let me omit it. Ah. So I have equation one, I have equation two. So these pictures are written as follows. It's better to write it here. So equation one together with equation two, what does it mean? It means that Q plus M1 Square equals to zero. And Q square equals to zero. You may ask, and you'll be very right, that you see here a symmetry between Q and M1. Okay. In this equation, they enter symmetric in symmetric way. And here we have exact zero. However, in equation one, we have homotopical zero. Okay. M1 squares only up to Q of M1. And you may ask why. And actually, it is because I would like to consider Q as something informally big. And I would like to treat M1 as a perturbation. So it's written M. However, in Russia, M comes from malinky, small. So we have a big differential like this, and we have a small differential. And later, later, this difference in these perturbative formulas would be continued, continued. I mean, this difference between big and small. So after you meditate on this, and on this, and how the symmetry between Q and M1 is broken here, And why this, and why if here we have zero, namely this thing, this thing, and this is zero, that this is bicomplex. And uh, just think why in bicomplex we have two Z gradings, and here we have only Z2 grading. So it's a good, it's a good point to think. So I'll leave you with this meditation and uh, and I'd like to discuss other equations. I'd like to add M2 here. So in the same way, I can write 
equations like m1 plus q m2 plus two other terms. M1 plus Q plus the third term. M2. M1 plus Q. And this is actually homotopical Leibniz rule. Leibniz rule. Once again, I want to stress homotopical Leibniz rule. So one of the way to see that it is homotopical Leibniz rule is to take the Q out. So if you take the Q out, You have the Leibniz rule for what? You have the Leibniz rule not for differential, but for homotopical differential. So would Q be zero? This would be the differential and this would be the Leibniz rule. However, in general, Q is not zero. So this is homotopical differential and this is a homotopical Leibniz rule that's that's again that's a, that is again true up to what up to homotopy that is achieved writing q here You see, you see that homotopy in the Leibniz rule is given not by any, not by other operations, but the operation M2 itself. You will just think about it. And interpret it in the way you prefer. So homotopical differential, homotopical Leibniz rule, and also homotopical associativity. And you have all these operations. And if you have labels, you may call it, of course, infinity category. Category. And you can write, and you can look to several people who are telling you that, that this structure is the main structure of the world. That this is the new way to think about geometry, about spaces. This is when, where we moved from Grossendieck and others to this point of view. So that's what mathematicians will tell you, like, Arlov or Bondo. So I know Russian mathematicians, but of course uh, other mathematicians are telling you the same thing. So if you are not Russian, you know your favorite mathematicians that say the same. They are all saying the same. Okay. Since I heard quite recently talks of Arlov on DG category, so I put him. Well, Andre, you're talking about al algebras, not categories, right? Categories. Why? Because because I have labels here. I was lazy to write down labels, but there are labels. You see, I spent so much ink in writing these things, so you could see the path 
of an object. You see, there are objects. So when you have this M1, you all, all, always have two objects. It's not that impressive. However, when you see M2, you already see the object alpha, the object beta, and the object gamma. And people from this school say that it is about category, object, morphism, differential, and uh, composition. And if you try to understand Fukaya, no, but wait, wait, wait with Fukaya. What, what happens with in the blobs? Well, what are the blobs in in, in here? The... Uh, well, there are different blobs here, like blobs with M2, blob with Q, blob uh -huh. with M1. This blob, mm -hmm. this blob stands for composition of the morphism. Okay. So, in all days of category theory, in all days of category theory, you are writing different pictures. So you want to say that this is axioms of A infinity category? Of course, but yes. maybe it's better for you to see what ha what happens with the pictures, because mm -hmm. in in old books this was written in the following way. You have two morphisms and uh -huh. you have a composition. Yeah. So this was an old way to write it down. So this is a point of duality. Uh -huh. yes. And now you are dualizing the picture. Mm -hmm. What was written as a point becomes an arc. And what was written as an arc becomes the point. Mm -hmm. So this is this is middle twentieth century. And this is end. In fifty years, people change the type how they are writing the pictures. Mm -hmm. Moreover, when String field when in the year 1985, Edward Wheaton was thinking about strings. Edward Wheaton, paper, open string theory. He was not only thinking in this way. That's what she wrote. For him, the string was an interval, and then you join it like this. And then he was trying, so he was trying to draw out this curve like this. So he was writing it where string was big in 85, the time when strings were big and objects were small because he was never thought of objects in 85. It was before the brain. So he had this picture and before, even before 85, there were so-called open string diagrams written on this way. So these ones pass of an object, this was a string, and that was how string were joining together. You can still see such pictures in, uh, in the books. So string was big, microscopic, okay? And this looked like diagrams from the middle 20th century when you think about category. 
Nowadays, at the end of 20th century, due to Fukaya in particular, we realized that things are different, that somehow objects are big. Okay? Objects are big, strings are small. Here, uh, this is a prototype of Fukaya category. So, mm -hmm. this big object alpha is a Lagrangian submanifold. This small string M1 is an intersection of Lagrangian submanifold. So, this is actually Fukaya picture. And this, or this, or this, it is uh, the quark picture, where the object, you see, in for quarks, for quark picture, the object is a point. For Fukai picture, the object is big. And, uh, and if you ask me, do I actually consider this as a progress? I would say no. I would say that there is universal concept for me. And uh, sometimes it's better to have this picture. Sometimes it's better to have this picture. Mm -hmm. OK? So still, it's very important how we think about it. So this is exactly DG or infinity category. It's very important notion. And, uh, and when you go to higher homotopies, etc., when you grow the dimension, you have infinity of infinity categories. But the main thing is, how do I write a picture? Here, in this world, write a picture like this. Here, exactly here, I'd like to make one more comment. This, everything here was about the operation. In operation, you have many inputs and one output. That's how we understand operations. However, if you are clever enough, you may think that, that there are two numbers. One number is the number of inputs, and another number is the number of outputs. OK? This is generalized. The notion of operation. So you could easily generalize it to the following picture. One, two, three inputs, four, five outputs, two outputs, okay? So there are many reasons to do this. In particular, in particle physics, when things collide, then you typically have not only one output, but several outputs. You have two particles coming out. Okay? So this is then a part. There's a question of how you're allowed to compose. Are you allowed to take like two outputs into two inputs simultaneously? So here you start to ask proper questions. Before you compose, before we compose, you can see if you can imagine such a thing. So you can, so first you need to imagine that thing can have two outputs. Since I am coming from high energy physics, for me it's easy to imagine that you have two outputs. Like you have electron, you have a photon, they scatter, And that's what happens. 
scattering. In the scattering, you always see that you have two outputs. Okay. Great Richard Feynman was thinking about equivalence of input and output. And he said, being a genius, that the output is an input where you put antiparticle. Hmm? Okay, maybe it's too deep, but uh, but somehow I can imagine two outputs, or I cannot. You see, it's hard to write it down on the graph. You see, I wrote something. However, you may ask, is it natural or not? Actually, it's so once again. It seems that I am asking stupid question. They are not stupid. They are actually deep. If you understand it for you, for yourself, you'll be able to understand formulas and axioms. So, Andrei, did, did you want me to remind you of the passage of time? Uh, yes, but I want ah, but I want you to start thinking about how to imagine two outputs. Okay. So is it easy to imagine two outputs? From the this perspective, you can. Imagine two outputs, yes. Then you will have an operation. So you so you see what could uh, bother you if you try to imagine yourself two outputs. Do you see something disturbing in this picture? So for me, the stopping thing is the following. Let me put orientation on the boundary. No, it's not that disturbing. You can actually imagine it. So from, from this perspective, it is, it is still natural. So maybe it would be, it, it, start, it becomes disturbing if you think about the arrows, but yes. How can you distinguish inputs and outputs? There is one point of view that there are the same. However, here they are definitely not the same. So you may think about it. So inputs and outputs. This picture implies that there is a, a symmetry between input and output. So this implies it. If you start with the algebra, you actually see that they, that they look very different. Uh, okay, Pasha. Mm -hmm. So uh, so the, the question is the time. So the time starts from from start of the recording. Okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't know uh, where uh, it was. Uh, I would like to say, say the other thing. So here we here we imagine two outputs, but there is another number that you can imagine, zero outputs. How to imagine zero outputs and be zero inputs. 
Okay. So here we have a five minutes break. Mm -hmm.
Okay, maybe we, we would continue. Sasha, mm -hmm. what about the time? Too short. Uh, but it, it's a wonderful time. I, yeah. Oh, time is always wonderful. Yes, uh, what, what, what was the question? <laughs> you want the race pistol or, or, or what? Uh, maybe I would like to continue. Yeah, yes, that would be great. Okay. So you see, I made the break. On the following issue. First, how natural is it? Look, when we studied the uh, Algebra at school, where we study polynomials, we know that there is multiplication. You have two polynomials coming in, or two numbers. You have one output. So we know about multiplication, and we never thought about co-multiplication from the very beginning. So when we dualize, OK? <clears throat> You see, it's a product. You see, you, 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 you always have a product. It's not natural in one way of, of thinking to have a co-product simultaneously. Or you may think that co-product is it's another structure. So to join and to divorce are two dif different operations, you see? So everybody who went through uh, marriage and divorce know that, uh, that, that these are very different operations, okay? So when you marry, you celebrate. When you divorce, there's no celebration, you see? That's why joining and splitting in our world are two different things. 
like multiplication and co-multiplication. Everybody knew about multiplication from schools. People don't uh, think about co-multiplication. Later they study co-multiplication. In the categories, it's very natural to compose morphisms. It's the most natural thing that you can do to compose morphisms. To make from two morphisms one. How can we imagine to make from one morphism two morphisms? You see? If you look here, if you look here, it is understood in the following way. If you have one output, you see, so now we are a bit on philosophy of mathematics. If you, if we have one output, it is clear what's going on. You have something and they annihilate, annihilate until you, you have only two things. Because what you have here, you have annihilation. Once again, how do you understand the composition? You have quark, anti-quark. Quark, anti-quark. What happens here? Anti-quark and quark are annihilated here. And you have here quark, anti-quark. So, so this is a process of annihilation. Annihilation means destruction, whatever. However, if you want to, <coughs> to have the dual process, You have to imagine the act of creation. So annihilation is one thing, creation is another thing. Okay, people in elementary particles feel that annihilation and creation are the same. Normal people do not feel it this way. We see the difference between annihilation and creation. That's why we see the difference between the product and co-product. What is great about the disk? Having the disk, we could rotate it. And we see that most probably these boundaries are equal. It's because we are writing it as a two-dimensional picture with the disk. Once again, in the category, you have A, B, B, C. You know that you are joining at B. You are joining two arrows at B. It's very natural. So the opposite thing is you start with AC, you have a line. And now you are created some B in between. You may ask how arrow from A to C knows which B is created. So in the most thing, Theory. You know that this happens. You have trajectory at point A to point C. Then this trajectory breaks and you include all points B that appear in the process. Okay, in Morse theory. However, in the normal category theory, you have morphisms of objects. You have something here and something here. How do you know that you could create all possible objects in your category. It's unnatural, you see. Say, you see, you have morphism, say, from CP1 
to CP2. And then we have morphism, holomorphic, from CP2 to CP3. It is clear what is the composition. However, how could you imagine that when you study morphisms from CP1 to CP3, you create everything in between. You create all Calabiao spaces, all manifolds here, and you sum over all of them. Pasha, don't you think that it's unnatural from the point of view of normal mathematician? Have an operation that creates everything in the middle. Okay, so so this is this philosophical aspect of why two to one, why we can imagine two to one, because it's destruction, and why it is hard one to two. Because it's an act of creation. In category, we create an object, we create all possible objects. Ah, no. However, but it is but that's what happens if you look at the disk. Here you are creating if you want to have two outputs. If you want to have two outputs, you are creating the new component B. And you need to think that this component B could be arbitrary. It's exactly the same picture, but for a disk. Once again, when people in particle physics are doing accelerator experiments, you know what they say? When they hit proton and antiproton, then they create all charged particles that you have in the world. That has energy less than the collision energy. All particles. And this is uh, this phenomena of virtual pair creation. Do you see? So these are thoughts that you should have if you just think that you can have two outputs, okay? Either you accept this world with creation or you prefer to think about only one output, okay? Now, there are other things. One interesting thing is uh, zero outputs, okay? So in, uh, in number theory in old days, it was very hard uh, to invent zero. So people say that it was some Indian mathematician who invented zero and then it came to Europe to understand that zero is a number. Now we need to understand that we can have inputs, but we can have zero output. What could it be? From the point of view of the disk, we understand it. We just write everything on one side. You see here I have three inputs, no outputs, nothing. So how, how something gives you nothing, it is hard to imagine. However, in elementary particle theory, People know that it is possible. You have
have a meso. So I'll call it quark by Latin letters, A B A B bar, anti anti quark. I have another meson, B A bar. So here I have. Okay, let me write it to this way. Here I have two inputs, then mesons annihilate. So in the real world, when meson annihilate, you emit something. But here you can you can just imagine that there is annihilation. You had something, everything disappears. Annihilation. Okay, now you can imagine this. Annihilation into what? Into nothing. You have two mesons at the beginning, you have nothing. You can have three mesons at the beginning. A, B. C, C bar. Something like this. A lot of things coming in, Babach. So this great Babach, we will call by new iteration. So I think that the good letter for this operation is F. So let us call this F3. And let us understand that this is an operation. That is F2. So you may ask why I call it as F. So there, there is such a reason. I, I don't know how to invent a proper mnemonic interpretation. Why this destruction? It, it would be, should be called F, but I'll call it F. One of the reasons why you should call it F is the following. Let us see how to imagine V to the tensor power zero. So people know how to imagine this. So who knows what is V to the tensor power zero? The ground field. Exactly, ground field. People used to call it key, right? So, <clears throat> based on this, we see that the result of this annihilation operation, when you have inputs and you have nothing, you still have something, you have this ground field, okay? So actually, this ground field uh, stands for the bunch of photons that you have when you have annihilation, you see? So mesons coming together, quarks are annihilating. As a result, you have no mesons, but you have something like photons. And this something is the ground field. So in this picture of correspondence between uh, particle theories, and the uh, tensor algebra, you may say that uh, quarks are objects, mesons are morphisms, and ground field is something where you have no quarks, no mesons. So ground field is a bunch of photons, okay? After we have bubuch, you have this photons. Now, why I call this F? Because you have inputs and the output is a ground field. 
So it looks like a function. You take something as an input and you have the number element of the ground feed as an output. So you have these operations, okay? So this is how to think about zero outputs. But if you have zero outputs, you also have another thing. You may have zero input. Huh? This is creation of V from nothing. Okay. So this is an operation of having a distinguished element. Okay. Okay. So before I'll go further in motivating this construction, I would like to understand how to include this annihilation operations or functions or no outputs. So if you have this operation, F, with inputs and no outputs, you cannot compose it. You see, it's interesting. You cannot compose this thing because uh, you have only inputs, okay? So what can you study? You can study only equations like this. Q plus plus Q, etc. Yes. Plus the rest. And you may ask when this is zero. So how do we understand it? We understand it as an invariance of F with respect to Q or as a closeness of so-called function operation. It's a reasonable thing that you could uh, demand, closeness. Okay. You can also put here M1. And such diagram would, would mean M1 closeness. However, a thing become more interesting if you have them too. If you have M2. You could have the following diagram. You see the rule is very simple. You write whatever you can write. So here we have two inputs. Here we have one output.
Who may compose it this way? What do we have here? Once again, this thing has no output. However, is there, you may think, is there any other way to have no output? And here we need to see the notion that is called a loop. There is another way to have no outputs. Just take an operation M. Let us take M1, M2, and let us do this. So we started with having two inputs, one output. Then we have one input, no output. Okay. It's a new phenomenon. It's a loop. And if you draw these pictures on the plane, you, you see that something interesting happened for the first time. You have not a disk. You have an analog. And this analog is topologically different from the disk, all right? Because it's an analog. Then you may think, look, this object has one input. There is another way to have one input. So you may consider this, or you may even consider this. Etc. Then it means that you may try to compare case with only inputs and this case when you make a loop. So you may you may uh, compare loops with this guy. Loops for operations with one output and this function. Um, sorry, Andrei, so actually in, in which sense uh, pictures that you are drawing are disks and annuli and... Uh -huh. So here, you see, I'm spending time writing the fat disks. Yes. Well, in which sense it's a disk actually? What you are drawing is a, is a, is a fat graph. Uh, yes, but then, if you consider this as a point, okay, you see the disk. Do you see the disk? So, so if you don't see the disk, I'll help okay. you see the disk. Okay, okay. So this is the disk. So you are not attaching any additional cells on the outside. No. So so this is an input. Okay. So I I drew an input like this, and I I would like to to say that that uh, this interval it is a it is a cut in the boundary. Mm -hmm. 
and then I would like to understand this cut as a boundary as a point. Okay, okay. And it's very natural in the, once again, Foucault theory uh, logic. In Foucault theory, people consider this disk as actually holomorphic disks. People say that object alpha. No, I, I thought that uh, yeah, like starting with the fat graph, uh, like people start attaching two cells to it and then you construct a surface, right? So, uh, so it depends what you say when you say fat graph. Yes, exactly, two cells. So when I'm writing a fat graph, yes, in my mind, I'm attaching this. Yeah, but they would attach the two cells on the outside somehow, on the outside of what you have drawn. So, but I prefer. <laughs> I okay, prefer, no, no, I understand the picture. Okay. <laughs> no, no. Uh, so people can, people can attach in different way. Mm -hmm. So the different, you see, different pictures means a different intuition. So picture. So actually, we have combinatorical data, and we we are trying to write down geometry behind it. I am writing this type of geometry. So you see, just by saying that uh, there is no commutativity in operation. Mm -hmm. In order to write down associativity, I started to write fat graphs. Starting writing fat graphs, I immediately come to this disk. Mm -hmm. Okay? So equations are the same, interpretations are different, and it, intuition is different. So I start to have these equations. And here, here, I see that these two things, namely this one and this one, have same number of inputs. Therefore, I can compare them but different topology. So does it mean that I cannot compare them? No, I still can compare them. Here I have the loop in internal topology. And here I do not have the loop. So I will think that Hiddenly, F has a loop. Hmm? What could it mean? In which sense this F hiddenly has a loop? At the moment, because I can compare it with this diagram. Okay, so these were just some wording. Now, now we need to have some formulas. After we draw pictures, we would like to have some formulas. And it turns out that in order to write down formulas, it is better to change the perspective a bit. Namely, first, forget fatness. So let us for a moment forget that we had fatness and come back from the open strings to particles. We restore it back later. What I'm trying to explain to you is very non-trivial 
procedure. Once again, we started with some natural concepts. We found that we are studying something about the fat graphs. And now I tell you, I'm telling you, let us forget fatness. Then everything would be the same. However, now we have ordinary graph. And it turns out that in the ordinary graph, we can interchange interchange inputs. And then let us see how many graphs would we have in this bilinear thing. So let me call this L2 and L2. I just call it L. Why? Not because my name is Lordship, it's, uh, it's there's some deeper reason. Let us see how many pictures do we have here? How many ways? In how many ways could we join one, two, and three together? Like this? One, two, three, like this. And also like this. One, sorry, once again. One, two, three. One, three, two, output. So one, two, one, three, and uh, One output, two, three. So here we have three diagrams. Instead of two, you may ask if these three diagrams better or simpler than two. It of course depends on the point of view. I just want to say that we have three diagrams. So what is the origin of these three diagrams? So we got these three diagrams when we admitted that we could interchange the inputs. Here, there is no way to interchange the inputs. It just has no meaning. However, if I draw a sphere, and I draw out, Do you see the sphere? Mm -hmm. And I call this is output. A circle coming out, circle coming in, another circle coming in. I can somehow interchange the inputs. And I can somehow think that uh, result would be the same. At least there is a homotopy if you have a sphere and you cannot change the input. You cannot do it on a disk. So it is something different, sphere. So now we keep fear in mind. Now we have these three diagrams. And we see that some of these three diagrams should be equal to zero. 
So what, what is the natural three diagram relations that we have? And you may think and see, yeah, hey, I know it. Jacobi identity. Huh? So basically you may think that this is Jacobi identity. So you are talking about Lie algebras. So when we forget fatness, we have we we are here, but we are not completely forget fatness. And so instead of an interval, we have a circle. So that's what we need to keep in mind that we have a circle here hiddenly, because it is this circle that makes sense to interchange inputs. Forgetting something we secretly are gaining something. Now, we may play the same game with higher operations. So, and they were about 14 minutes after the break. Put here L1. Put here Q, everything is the same. Everything is the same. And uh, the structure that we will get out of this is called an infinity algebra. Because uh, we can complete. Jacobi identity by by structures like this, and of course. By structure like this. You see, I'm just drawing up pictures. So if you understand the language of pictures, you can draw all pictures yourself. And, and you can see that what is written here is Jacobi up to homotopy. And of course, These pictures are the same. So these pictures are the same. And this is called Leibniz. Okay. Then you may ask why it is good to study L infinity while the main thing on the world seems to be A infinity. Okay. A infinity is about something important, it's about the space. It's about something big. L infinity Lie algebra is a, it's about the symmetries and deformations. Okay. So you may start to think that these objects are in some sense tangent to infinity objects. Then before I'll write down more formulas, I'll try to explain my feeling. 
in some sense, symmetries are smaller than the object itself. However, in some sense, it's also bigger because uh, symmetries and deformations, you see, govern the object, okay? So the object is big. However, its deformation theory is even bigger. Okay, these are words. These are pictures. Now, let me come down to equations, finally. Okay. So, and, and, and we are a bit more than 40 minutes after the break, so. Uh... Mm. So, okay, uh, let us stop here. I actually, uh, I, I just want to say three, two more words. What I'm trying to teach you, I'm trying to teach you to feel the pictures if you don't feel it. So when you feel the pictures, just believe me. When you feel, when you start feeling the pictures, you can write down all formulas naturally. Okay? There'll be no question for you how to write down formula. If you understand what's going on on the level of pictures. Okay? So I'm teaching you pictures and geometry behind picture. And whenever you have a problem in your intuition with pictures, okay, you just need you you just need to imagine this picture, how to deal with it, how to rotate with it. You see, like I did. I I'd like to interchange one or two. What does it mean? It means there should be homotopy between uh, inputs. That's how I got the sphere, okay? Almost from nothing. Just homotopy of this rotation. Once again, great John bias. All relations are homotopical. All homotopies have a, could be written down geometrically and written down algebraically. And you should be able to work in this world, okay? So first you think that you are losing uh, strings to particle, object, space, to deformation, but then you hit, but then you see that it has hidden circle in it. Okay. Okay. Now I make a break.
Паша? А, да, да. Сколько времени прошло? А, что? Сколько времени прошло? Не знаю, наверное, можно начинать. Давайте начнем. Давайте начнем. Потому что у меня время течет э, с разной скоростью в голове. Это гравитационное красное смещение? Да, 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 да. Потому что я ведь думаю одновременно с рассказом. Поэтому да. у меня время течет с разной скоростью. Ну, нужно какой-то как котов это самое заранее, наверное, установить. Да, да, да. Вот это нужно придумать какой-то вот нормальный. Ну, вот у меня, не знаю, вот в 5 часов мне нужно будет точно мои отсоединиться. Да нет, все, у нас, у нас последняя третья часть. Ага. К сожалению, на сегодня. Значит, so, so before I start the third part, once again, I would, I'd like to apologize, okay? I am going to slowly because I'm trying to pass to your intuition. So it is not like uh, European uh, mathematics. You have the definition, uh, you prove theorems. It's like in the East. It's like a Buddhism training. I'm trying to pass to you the feeling. So I hope that you, that some of you, at some moment would reach Satori and would be able to think in these pictures and to write down formulas immediately. Okay, so now, now I'm coming to the question of formulas. So what I'm, so what I'll try to explain right now. First, I'll try to explain that this very natural or oh, natural uh, relations between operations could be plugged together into formulas. And these formulas could be plugged together in the BV formulae. Okay? But, uh, so, Andrei, with your pictures with circles, uh, did you mean to say that um, um, sort of, uh, well, Closed string algebra in some sense is L infinity and open string is A infinity. Yes, actually closed string algebra is a bit more than L infinity, but at least it contains L infinity in it. Mm -hmm. And you may meditate on the issue to which extent all N, all L infinity is uh, are uh, strings. Are closed strings. And it is a good issue of meditation. But at the moment, what I'd like to what I'd like to show, I'd like to write down equations. Now I'll write down equations. And uh, I will write, and it turns out that the easiest equations that you could write are equations for L infinity. So it is puzzling, okay? How it may be that the, in some sense, higher structure is given by the simpler equations. But then I will do the following. I would be able to put A infinity equations inside the L infinity framework, okay? So it is this issue of complexity. Things, I would say, things are related. You could not say who is higher, who is lower. There are things and they are related in an interesting way. And I'm showing you things and relations, okay? So, Let me come to this L infinity. So these are graphs, okay? Just graphs where we can permute
input. So when you first think about graphs, when you open the definition of the graph, it is so obvious that you can permit inputs. But now, when you have fed graphs, you understand that ability to permit inputs, it's a property. You see, it's interesting. But now I want like to go to formulas. So in L infinity, we go from V tensor M to V. So here I have LN operations. Okay. Collection. And then I would like to do the following. <clears throat> Having these operations, I would like to pack them together. in a vector field. Well, on V, on V or on V star. So these would be functions, maybe on V star, we will see. Possible correct. Maybe on V. And here will be a vector field. And this would not be just V, it would be formal V. So you may ask, what do I mean by formal V? So if I have V vector space, uh, 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 linear space, I have V star. So V star is a linear coordinate on V, okay? And then V star tensor M is a what a function on V. So let me question. So let me question. Uh, so it's a linear coordinate, so it's a function. So here I multiply these functions. So it is much better not to tensor it, but to take this one or this one. I should try to think about it as a functions on V. Okay. So it will be a vector field on V with shifted parity. Yes. So, so if I, so I could do it this way, I could do it that way, but in any case, formal V, formal V is, should be a spectrum on lambda star mm. formal v it's spectrum of c star of this one with the shifted parity okay it will be called formal v so it that I allow only polynomial functions and even formal series.
Now, I have these operations. Let me <coughs> let me do a lies. When I do a lies, I have maps from V star to V star tender M. Okay. I may call it du dual. Then I may understand these maps as a differentiation of diff differentiations on formal V. You see, in order to define diff, I need to define it on function, okay? So if I know uh, how diff is defined on functions, on any functions, I know what differentiation is. So I need to define what is diff on V star. Okay, so differentiation should take V star where? Somewhere to the space of functions, to an element Ln star of V. Okay, I put here S, you will put the parity later on. I take linear function into some nonlinear. And of course, here I can make a sum. I can write it down in coordinates. If elements of V star are called PA. Okay, then then this differentiation is given by the vector field d over d t a t a one t a k and here I have l a one a k a. So this is very important formula. If it's seen, I would call it D L and here I have the sum over A and over K. Maybe this formula is so important that I should put it I should rewrite it again. Very important formula. This set of operations correspond to the vector field differentiation. Sum over K. Sum over A, A1, AK. You see, I was saying you blah, 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 blah. Then I wrote this DL. The main equation is DL 
square equals to zero. So this, this single equation implies all these quadratic equations for L. Hmm? All by hand waving about the spheres and the rotating inputs, everything is here. And of course, Q, Q is also here because of course, here I have non-perturbative term, T over DT, Q, A, B, B, A. All these homotopy relations, everything in a single, equation. And this object is called homological vector field. So that's a way how to write down L infinity. So it is an important moment in the life. L infinity is this. I will have immediate consequence. Suppose I have L infinity. How can I identify it? Two L infinity. First of all, why should I identify that? You see, I could uh, try to explain it, but uh, it will take more time for writing pictures. I'll explain it on this language, okay? We have vector field that squares to zero. Do we have a natural symmetries here? Of course, yes, we do. If we take dl that squares to zero and put and transform it to dl plus dl, any formal vector field u then this would also solve this equation. The proof, I think it's obvious. In the first order in U. Because it will be this DL, DL U that equals to zero. I just plug this thing here and then the first order in U. And this follows from the fact that DL squares to zero. So this is algebraic manipulation. And this algebraic manipulation could be done on the level of operations, you see? On the level of operations, you can see, look, what does it mean? It means that this operation is modified by this operation. This is U, this is L. 
So this is symmetry, okay? So this is a picture of the symmetry. And this symmetry operation that has k inputs go to operation that has k plus m inputs, okay? Something very non-obvious on the level of operations. However, it is a symmetry. And it is also possible to understand it geometrically. This thing is nothing but the diffeomorphism. Formal diffeomorphism of the formal vector field is still a diffeomorphism. So we collected this operation and then we do a crazy thing. We study diffeomorphisms on formal coordinates and these are symmetry. Okay, so we study homological vector fields on the formal disk up to diffeomorphisms. And this is a great symmetry. And, uh, and this is a great structure. So, in this construction, not only we formalized the infinity structure, but we not only we wrote it as a single equation, but we formulated equivalences, symmetry of the structure. So this is great. But symmetry of the structure come together with the structure. And there is no relation here, okay? If you feel a bit uncomfortable here, let us consider the simplest example. Simplest example is when you have only L1, L1 squares to zero. What is this? You change L1 by L1 U plus U L1. Okay. So maybe the proper sign would be minus, but I don't care about times. So this symmetry says that you go from L1 to L1 plus L1 commutator with U. So this is a normal way how you are changing differential. Example of example. Example of example. Of course, you know this. Just imagine that you have D and you are going to D plus DF. Okay. It's called written deformation. Yes. However, this deformation is very big. So here the space of deformation is very big. And these are just particular examples how you are doing this, how you are deforming the structure. You can write down it, you can write it down in many ways. But now I would like to move towards A infinity because I promised you, I promised you one thing. A infinity is great, but A infinity is also great. Is it possible to write down A infinity in the same way? Is the same way. So attempt number one. 
attempt number one would be to say that why do we have this L infinity and not A infinity? Because this super commute. So now attempt number one is to say we will get A infinity if T A T B would be not related to T B T A. Huh? So here there were super commutative, and here they are not related. independent and uh, this way to write down things is called formal non-commutative disk so you st you think about these objects as a formal object in some formal algebra Okay. And then when you are taking derivatives here, you need to think how you are how you are doing it. What does it mean to take derivative? When T of when T's are formal objects. Just three generators of an algebra. And still it is possible to think in this way. And then you will get A infinity. Because here we are losing, completely losing uh, super commutativity. I could leave it as it is, and some people actually stop here. But I actually would like to do more, okay? Because I don't consider this putting A infinity inside L infinity. It's of course not there. I actually would like to put A infinity inside L infinity. So how do I do it? I will do it with a trick that turns out to be very important. You know, many constructions started when people try to prove something or to generalize something. You not only achieve your goal, you also achieve more. So let me start with the issue, how to put L infinity or A infinity inside L infinity. How to write it down, not as something non-commutative non that you don't feel, but in some other way. And the idea is the following. Let us do the following. Let us consider the space V that I call M. And this space V that I call N would be endomorphisms of CN multiplied tensor by V. This label, okay? So coordinates, so elements of V star M would be TAs that are just matrices. So you may ask why I have these matrices and answer is that I have these matrices in order to mimic uh, non-commutativity because matrices do not come.
the following object dl n that is so this is a remarkable thing this is very important formula i still have a1 a k a and here i'll put t a1 alpha beta t a2 beta gamma all the way down till t a k gamma i don't know something epsilon d over d t a and I still put here uh, epsilon alpha. And I sum here. I make another sum over all these indices. Alpha, beta, gamma, etc. Now. Consider equation DLM square equal to zero. So it would be equation on L And in writing down this, so I call it L. Now I'd like to call it M. Sorry. So in this presentation, I do not have any symmetry here. So when I write down this equation, I will get what? I will actually get a infinity equation when n goes to infinity. It's a tricky thing. And uh, this and this was observed. Do you know who observed this? This was basically an observation of Tchoft. He was doing particles that take value in matrices. And he was looking on invariants that you can have here. And sometimes he was looking at so-called uh, large n contributions. And he found that in this way, amplitudes go to the fat graphs. It was Tchoft observation. So it takes time to understand this. Moreover, so now I can erase this. If n capital equals to one, we have L infinity. When n equals to plus infinity in this structure, we have a infinity. 
and we have something in between. So this is the greatest cons construction in terms of formula. You just need to imagine what is going on. How we take the, uh, how we differentiate. And what happens with the commutator. And then immediately one start to have a question. First, what are one of n corrections? Maybe one of n squared or one, or one of our n corrections. It's the first thing. Second thing. <clears throat> Okay, so these are matrices, and what I actually do here with the sum, I consider the trace. Okay, I consider the trace. However, trace of the product is a SLN invariant, and moreover. It is the simplest SLN invariant. What if I consider other group acting here and other invariants? And here you immediately see that you have a huge number of possibilities. And this construction is a particular case of an enormous type of construction. And you may think what would happen here. And I, I would like to say that complete answer is not known yet. So my conjecture, conjecture is that if you have so-called single trace construction, it corresponds to a disk. Single trace. That if you have double trace, it corresponds to two disks, or as Pasha was saying, Maybe it corresponds to a sphere with two disks cut out. Because Pasha proposed another way to, to fill in the fat graph, etc. And when you deform this invariant theory, you should be able to put something on the boundary of the disk, and you will have these. Uh, categories of brains here. So all these things start when you do this construction. When you just naively try to put A infinity inside L infinity. You actually do it in this particular case, but you have a lot of possibilities that, that are open, okay? So it is the first thing. That's why this construction is much better uh, than to say that you have just this formal non commutative vector field. Now, another game. You have DLL, okay? Sorry, you have DL. So it's a vector field. So vector field is about operations with one output. 
Now, what about operations with zero output? They that, that I called F. Of course, I wrote the, I wrote down equations, quadratic equations. What is the way to pack them together? Actually, the way to pack them together would be to do the following thing. So let us see what kind of what kind of operations were there. There were these three level operations plus this type of things. Okay. So these are loop structures. And uh, these could be packed together in the following set of equations. First, of course, dl dl squares to zero. Then this thing is nothing but divergence of dl. And this thing is equation that divergence of dl is dl applied to f. I get this set of equations. So once again, f means no output. Yeah, so this means that exponent exponential of f is the inv dl invariant measure. Of course, Pasha, because you somehow explained it to me. <laughs> that that's why, of course, you know it. But now let us let us pack these things together, and it is po and I think it's possible to pack this thing together if we do what. So we have here h divergence, yes. So that's that's what we have here. So so packing this together, right, Pasha? Pasha, you are absolutely right. Right? Pasha, am I right? Uh, I'm not sure what this means. Uh, I meant that the divergence of dl with respect to the measure with density exponent of f is zero. Yes, at the moment, I wrote this in the standard measure. Mm -hmm. Standard measure. Given by the linear structure. Right. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, in the in the standard measure you just get the equation written above. Yes. So in the standard measure, it's it's exactly in the standard measure, you get this. Mm -hmm. However, you can also re rewrite it in the following way. Keep H here and put E to the F here. I don't know, what is the exponent of the vector field? What do you mean? Ah. The question is, 
uh, why this is this. So it, it was explained. So consider vector field as a polyvector field. Ah, okay. Okay, yes. No, th then yes. You can multiply vector fields. Okay? Yeah. In polyvectors. So okay. this e you... to the d over h is a polyvector. Mm -hmm. And so we just we discussed it. And being a polyvector, we can ask if its divergence is zero or not. Mm -hmm. So this equation, this equation, or this equation, so there are two ways to look at equation star. They different in the following way. You can look at it this way. And here you see that F is multiplied by h bar. And here you see that this is the fact that this operation to zero has hidden loop inside. It is an interpretation. The second way is to write it down this, this way and to say that this e to the f might be put in inside the divergence. So there is divergence corresponding to the with modified top form. We change top form dt1, etc. dt, we change it to omega. That is e to the f of t, dt1, dtm. We call it omega f. And that's why this equation turns out to be divergence with respect to omega f of e to the d l h equals to zero. Huh? So we managed to pack everything inside the single equation. All quadratic relations between L and quadratic relations between L and F, everything is packed in, in a single equation, okay? So I told you that we have two things. We have pictures and we have equations. So this is uh, so this is the equation that we have here. And now here we worked out case where there was what one output, no outputs. Okay. And you might think, let me put it as an open problem. How to write down an equation and what it would be if I have several outputs. So let me put it. So since, Pasha, I think my time is close to be over. Yes. So let me put it as a question for tomorrow. How to write down something if you have several outputs? The hint, one out of a vector, zero output is a function. Several outputs is what? Polyvector. Vector. Who's polyvector? Mm -hmm. 
So uh, the question is how to write down the quantum master equation in terms of this picture and how to write these pictures in, in, uh, the, in case of infinity. You see, everything comes together. So today, I have not uh, discussed the descent of BV integral. However, I explained uh, how, how starting from associativity equation and thinking about commutativity, you can go here. I hope that it was uh, somehow natural. Not by definition, you see, I could start with this definition. If you have this definition, you would get no intuition. You don't know how, to, where to see it, how to modify it. It will be just definition. You see, this is for user, okay? And what I am trying to tell you is SDK, Self Development Kit, okay? I show you the internal structure, why things are made like this. So that, such that you can modify it. Not only use it as prescribed, you can modify it because you know why it's like this, okay? Because after all, this is universal geometry, you see? Not only it is universal geometry, it is also universal quantum field theory. Because of course it came from, it came from the field theory, so it is there. Geometry is here, everything is here. So it is good to understand how it works, okay? Not how to write down it is in, in a single, uh, equation. And to see different examples of these constructions here, there, everywhere. Like in category, okay? When people start doing categories, it was important not to give a definition of the category. It's too simple. It was important to see different categories. And what, and what are the structures? And the same with, okay, associativity, commutativity. You give a definition, you say what? That you uh, described all geometry? Not really. You need to know how to operate with it. You need to see the example. However, all these examples are organized in some framework. In, algebra, in old algebraic geometry, it was a framework of associativity and commutativity. In modern algebraic geometry, you forget, uh, you forget commutativity, you have uh, homotopical associativity, and you talk about categories and not about rings. But it's still in the same, it is still in the same framework as quantum field theory. And that's why in quantum field theory, you find these structures, you find these structures in string theory. You find these structures in geometry. So this is about the most universal and important structure in both world in physics and in mathematics. That's why there are worthwhile some discussions, you see. So they are so important that it was to discuss them again and again and spend time on it. from one perspective or another, from another perspective, okay?
So, by the way, we already have found the annulus here. So, when we studied divergence, we already found an annulus. Please let me remind you that we start to get some some Riemann surfaces already. So this divergence is about annulus. You take disk, you make an annulus, this is divergence. So this H bar is not a formal parameter. Not a formal parameter, I'm sorry. It has a meaning. One of its meaning is the topology of operation. Operation have topology. Hmm? Okay, Pasha, I think I need to stop here. Uh, yes. Um, thank you. So let's stop the recording.